This session makes the case for national inquiries as a particularly effective tool for the promotion and protection of human rights. It reflects on some of the lessons we've learned at the New Zealand Human Rights Commission and it also draws on the very useful uh, manual published by the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions and the Royal Wallenberg Institute on, called Manual on Conducting a National Inquiry and we'll have details of that available for you to use. And a national inquiry is an investigation into a systemic human rights issue in which the general public is invited to participate. Major human rights issues, particularly those relating to economic, social and cultural um, problems are complex. What a national inquiry does is give us an opportunity to consider a human rights issue comprehensively. And interestingly enough, although the term national inquiry isn't mentioned in the Paris Principles, they do contain all of those functions that the Paris Principles say human rights commissions should undertake. Um, investigation, education, research, advice and recommendations. That they're all part of a national inquiry. And undertaking a national inquiry is a major commitment for an NHRI in both all sorts of dimensions, resources, particularly financial and human. Um, and I think our mantra became, you know, think about how much time you think you need for this inquiry and then double it. Um, and we did find that we really needed to dedicate, you know, a lot of resource to make it effective. And the key elements we found we needed to cover were thorough planning and preparation, um, consultation with all affected parties at every stage, so it's multiple consultations, um, not just a one-off, very much giving voice to the victims or the most vulnerable people in the relation to the inquiry, and absolutely crucially, commitment to follow up. You haven't finished the inquiry when you're published. First of all, with respect to preparation, choosing and explaining the issue or the subject of a national inquiry is critical because actually when communities and organisations know that you're open to doing national inquiries, you get a raft of requests for a national inquiry on almost everything. Um, and I think one of the factors that, is not, it's, you know, it's not the only factor, but a factor to take into account is can you use this inquiry to demonstrate the value of human rights to those who aren't minorities, for example, the value of human rights to everyone. And I think the Northern Ireland um, Human Rights Commission's inquiry into emergency health care is a good example of that, because at some point everybody knows someone in their family or their friends who have to use, and, and all of us may have to use emergency health care. Um, but it's also true that a national inquiry can be a very important way of building understanding about the position of a particularly stigmatised or marginalised group. Um, part of the preparation um, should include consulting with the groups that are affected and with other NGOs and civil society organisations and with experts. And I mean, what I'm saying here is that the preparation in itself can take almost as much time as the public elements of the inquiry. It's critical to brief relevant government ministers and their agencies and any other organisation that might be the subject to scrutiny of an inquiry. So just to finish up on the preparations, you need to develop objectives in terms of reference, um, set out the parameters of the inquiry because again, you've got to be very careful that it's not, you know, that it's, that it's sufficiently focused, that it's manageable. Um, and Joanna mentioned, you mentioned the time frame and the methodology and I certainly agree with, you know, the idea of doubling the time frame that you first think of. Um, and the resourcing, allocating resources, human and financial, and getting commission approval and a formal resolution is vital because when you're putting so many resources into one activity, you need to have that, the full commission behind it. Um, and the final thing is, having gone through all that, having got the commission approval, is to publish a background paper which tells all of the affected parties and the public and the media, we're having a national inquiry, this is what it's going to cover, this is how we're going to do it, these are the terms of reference and these are the key questions that we want answered. So that illustrates the extent to which you need to have done good research beforehand.
And I talked earlier about how consultation at every stage was absolutely critical to the credibility of the inquiry. Um, and I think something to focus on there is, is using public hearings. Um, and again, we've used those um, to good effect in the inquiries that we've done in New Zealand, and I've heard about that elsewhere as well. Um, things to think about, I think, with those inquiries, uh, sorry, those public hearings, is geographically where will they be held? Um, you know, with limited resources that NHRIs have, um, we'll have to be selective, um, but you have to balance that with still meeting the Paris Principles requirements to be accessible. Um, so whilst major urban centres are an obvious pick in terms of the greatest concentration of populations, um, provincial cities, you know, towns, villages, may provide actually more access to for people who are affected um, also often greater media coverage because there's less competition um, and but most particularly reach people who may not otherwise understand or be connected with the work of the National Human Rights Institution. I think to be accessible also requires very practical considerations about the nature of the venue of the hearings, um, the setting within the venue, um, the use of government premises often is quite a barrier, it's quite formal, um, may, may put people off coming. Uh, you also have to think about the provision of services to enable participation of people with disabilities. Um, and provision has to be made also for confidential hearings where people don't feel, feel able to speak in public for whatever reason, um, they still need to have a voice in the inquiry. Mm. There's two other points we want to make about national inquiries. One relates to the report. It must be authoritative and convincing, so it's got to be technically expert, depending whatever the subject is you're dealing with, it's got to have strong legal analysis. But in my view, above all, it must be interesting to read. And, you know, so in addition to the accurate and fair summary of the evidence, an explanation of the relevant provisions of human rights law, and the inquiry's own analysis of the situation, its findings, conclusions and its recommendations, it must ensure that the voices of the victims are heard clearly and explicitly throughout the report. I mean, we've done that, tried to do that consistently in our reports, and I'd highlight, for example, the uh, To Be Who I Am, which is our report of the transgender inquiry, which starts with 12 stories from a diverse range of trans people, and I think it's, even if you never read anything else, you'd really understand um, their experiences in ways that, that you wouldn't have otherwise. The second point, and we've made it in brief earlier, it relates to consult consultations. The New Zealand Commission um, came to the view that it was important to consult on the drafts. Now that didn't mean to say, to say send the whole draft out to every single person who submitted or anything, but all the key stakeholders should get those sections of the draft that cover them and they should also get in draft any recommendations. And the reason for this was, is to avoid making any errors of fact. It also enables you to find out whether there's any strong objections to the recommendations, even though hopefully the process you've used has built consensus around the key recommendations. Um, and it prevents people responding um, you know, out of surprise. So I think that those are, that, that's, um, you know, those have been some of our major lessons in terms of conducting the inquiry. The last point is that we discovered that you needed to put aside time, almost as much time, on follow-up. Because even if governments welcome your report, and they might, that might just be a sort of superficial response, to actually get them to do something, requires follow-up and persistence and in our case we found that it wasn't just advocating for the report taking opportunities to publicize its recommendations in different situations it was also supporting those groups who would benefit from the recommendations supporting them um, to develop their skills and cap capability to advocate for the recommendations and again with both the accessible journey and the transgender inquiry we had some fantastic outcomes from people from those communities actually becoming strong advocates for the reports and really therefore contributing to achieving change um, when it finally came but in our view you have to leave you have to plan to follow up for at least three years 
and you have to report on what's happening in your annual report um, each of those three years. And as a learning organisation, also evaluation is really important um, to learn the lessons from, from the experience and apply those to, to the future. And it's particularly important um, on a national inquiry, um, it's good practice in any case, but in a national inquiry the amount of resource that you have expended on the inquiry um, means that it's really important to evaluate its effectiveness. And because it takes time to get significant action on the recommendations, um, really the findings and the evaluation has to be in two parts. Um, the first is on the process. How well was the inquiry conducted and did we manage successfully to conduct all the elements that we thought were important? And the second part focuses on the outcomes. What has the inquiry actually achieved? And I do think that's something that we may not even know for 10 years in some instances.